Uh, good morning once again, folk. It's time for our morning uh, <coughs> sermon from the Scriptures. And the sermon is entitled, Jesus, Our Rock. And it's found in Luke, Luke chapter 6, verses 46 to 49. Luke 6, verses 46 to 49. Reading from 46, Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundations on a rock. And when the flood waters rose, the waters rose and they beat against that house and could not move it, for it was founded on a rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation, against which the flood waters broke, and immediately it collapsed, and it crumbled into a heap of ruins. Now, broadly speaking, there are two categories of people in the world and also uh, in the church. Uh, when I say the church, I mean the whole church of God everywhere. There are the yeses and the professors. When times are favourable, both will carry on with their daily lives, and of course, to all outward appearances, everything seems fine. But you know, as what happens, when the trials of life come, and they will, and they do, when the trials of life come, then the question is, what then? What then? And the outcome depends on that foundation. <coughs> we'll look at house number two, the professor. The professors of religion. Uh, we don't want to be like this type of a person. Uh, Jesus said, He who heard my words and did nothing about them, he is like the man who built his house on the ground without a foundation. And when the flood waters came and beat against it, immediately it collapsed and it crumbled into a heap of ruins. These are the professors. Um, uh, in all my experience uh, in church, and you may have known it yourself, down through the years you meet this type of a person, uh, the, the professors. Uh, more than once somebody has said to me, apparently very earnestly, yes, yes pastor, I'll see you in church on Sunday. I'll be there. And of course you're so glad about that. And then you wait for Sunday to come and they don't come. They don't pitch. And they don't even apologize later on. They just say, yes, I'll be there. And then they don't come. Uh, Jesus said, uh, we mustn't worship him with our lips only. He says, we must worship him with our hearts. In other words, mean what we say. Mean what we say. And talking about this matter of uh, being disappointed by these types of, of uh, professing Christians, um, I can remember years ago here in Marisburg, uh, the church I was attending, it was holding a, a series of special meetings. And in the course of that afternoon, uh, I met up with someone and uh, they needed a lift home because they were hitchhiking. And I picked them up and I drove all the way to Cato Ridge. And um, we spoke about it, spoke about the Lord. And as I dropped them off, uh, I said, would you like to come to some special meetings we're conducting? They, and that person said, yes, I'll come said, all right, I'll come for you tonight. I'll pick you up at six o'clock. They said, that's fine. I'll be waiting. And of course, I left early, so I wouldn't be too late for the service. And uh, I arrived at the appointed spot at six o'clock. I waited and I waited and I waited. I waited as long as I did. And of course, they didn't come. They didn't come. You know, the sad thing about these types of, of professors, People who say they'll do something and they don't. Uh, you ask yourself, how can I ever trust your word again? How can I ever trust you? And sometimes we say, yes to the Lord. Yes to the Lord. I'll do this. I'll do that. You can count on me, Lord. And then we don't do it. How can God trust you? How can God trust you? And um, if you want God, if we want God to trust us, you have to keep our word. You have to keep our word. A lot of Christianity is based on keeping our word. Have to keep our word. 
be true to what we say. Otherwise, how can people trust us? Now, people of the second category um, who say yes and they don't do it. Um, I wonder, how do people uh, who've lived their lives without the need of Christ or, or prayer or worship in the church or even of God, uh, what do they do when trouble comes? I was talking to Ria about this yesterday and she said, she asked somebody this question one day, tell me with all this that's going on in your life, how do you live? How do you live? How do you live without the Lord? And she said, they, they couldn't answer her. They couldn't answer her. How do you live if you haven't got a foundation? You know, the thing about foundations is this. Uh, they are out of sight. They're out of sight. And if the foundation is there, um, it's either a good foundation laid with materials that are precious to God, or uh, it will be a bad foundation laid with materials that are like garbage in, in God's sight. Paul talks of wood, hay, and stubble. That foundation, <clears throat> our yeses to God, that's the foundation. And if that's weak, what a foundation we have. But none. Now, what reveals the strength or weakness of every house? What reveals the strength? It will be when the storms of life come. That's when the strength of that house will be tested. And they will come, and the house with a poor foundation, or no foundation at all, hasn't got a hope. Friends, let's take, pay attention to our foundation. Years ago in America, uh, a little town, um, on the edge of that town, there was a hollow piece of ground uh, considered as useless, and so that, that piece of ground on the outskirts of town became the garbage dump. And as the, the months went by and the years went by, the people would come and throw their rubbish in the dump, rubbish of every description, um, tin cans and uh, old pieces of furniture, old shoes and everything. And this carried on until there was no room anymore for that dump to be used. Um, a land developer, however, he saw an opportunity to make some money. And so he bought the dump at a very cheap price. And of course, uh, he hauled in tons of sand and he spread the sand over all the, all the rubbish that was there. And he brought in the machinery and they compressed the soil, compressed the ground until it was hard. And then um, when that area was, was finished, he leveled it off and he had produced a site that appeared to be attractive. And of course, no sign of the rubbish underneath was visible. He brought in his builders, and in no time they built many houses. It became a nice little suburb. They laid out the roads and the parks and everything. Oh, it was a, a nice place to live. And the, the houses sold like hotcakes. This is where everybody wanted to live. And soon there was a thriving community living in the houses built on the land. That had once been a rubbish dump. Under the houses were old tin cans and all other kinds of rubbish. And of course the years went by and then a gradual change came over that once happy community. They noticed that their walls of their houses started to crack. Um, the roofs started to sag in. <coughs> uh, the roads outside um, gave way and and holes appeared in the road. The whole place seemed to be disintegrating. Uh, what was happening? The subsoil underneath was moving. After a while, that once lovely area, it was abandoned. And the old town residents who knew the secret of that place, they shook their heads. They knew what the others didn't. Those homes had been built upon garbage <laughs> upon garbage and our lives are like that too you know we can build it on garbage being disloyal to the Lord and so forth you know people who say they love Christ and have never accepted him in the end they don't amount to much 
a house with a bad foundation. Now, the other house, the house with a good foundation, uh, if you read the scriptures, the Bible says, and Jesus said, this is the house that's built on the rock. Um, these are those who, who love Christ um, and they show it by their lives and it, it, it's wonderful to behold. And in John 14, 21, Jesus said, the one who obeys me, this is the one who loves me. Obedience is what God calls for. And obedience is, is, is what's included in the foundation. And this one who obeys God, the one who loves him, uh, in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 11, Paul says, this is the one whose foundation is Christ. And if you read only 1 Corinthians 15, Paul uses the words like, they are steadfast and they are immovable. Uh, and when the storms of life come and, and batter against uh, the building of their lives, uh, when it's all over, he's still standing. I saw a clip on TV once about this area where a great flood had swept through the valley and everything in its path was swept away. And there, unbelievably, on a pillar of rock about 20 feet up, was this house on this pillar of rock as though nothing had happened. Everything around it was devastation except this house which was built on the rock. You see, that rock, it was hidden by the foundation, by the soil and everything that was around it. And when the, when the time came, it was the only survivor. It was the only survivor. Friends, there is coming a time when the storms of life are coming, the judgment of God. The ones who will stand and withstand will be the ones whose foundation is Christ. <clears throat> the yeses. Now, if you read the Bible, especially many characters in the Old Testament, um, they were the yeses. When you think of Abraham, you can find his testimony in Gen Genesis chapter 22. Abraham had an only son. He loved him very much. His name was Isaac. And uh, in verse 1 we read that God came to Isaac one day and he said, I want you to take your son Isaac and I want you to sacrifice him to me on one of the mountains of Moriah. What would you say? What would you say? You'd recoil in horror. No, Lord, never. Unthinkable. Mm -hmm. God said to Abraham, this is what I want you to do. And Abraham, without hesitation, if you read the, the scripture, he simply says, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Um, Abraham, uh, the rule of Abraham's life was yes. Yes, Lord. Um, and at this time, severely tested, God asks him to do something which no person, no parent could ever do. But Abraham says yes to the will of God. It's very hard. And of course, he reaches the place of sacrifice and Isaac is on the altar and Abraham is about to plunge the knife into him and, and God sees this, this guy is serious. He's going to obey me. He's actually going to do it. And God has to hurry. And, and God calls out from heaven, Abraham, wait, wait. And he sends an angel to hold his hand back. Abraham was actually going to do it. Yes, Lord. He was God's yes man. He was God's yes man. Even to the point of going all the way. And you know, Abraham trusted God so much. That's why he could say yes quite easily to the will of God. He trusted God so much. He believed afterwards, if you read in Romans, he actually believed that God would raise Isaac from the dead again. That's why he knew he could go through it as God raised his own son up from the dead. The rule of Abraham's life to the will of God was, yes, Lord. And the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the rule of his life to his heavenly Father was the same. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And of course, Abraham has got that, that wonderful title now. It's a title above all earthly titles. He's called the friend of God. The friend of God. And you know, God never tested him like that ever again. God didn't have to. Because he knew Abraham loved him. <clears throat> and in verse 18, 22, God says, In your seed all nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed 
my voice. Do you know of any Christians who are like this? Their whole life is, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. You might have known some in your own church, uh, where you may be. Um, uh, there are those people, the yes, Lord types. Oh, what a blessing they are. What a tremendous blessing they are. These are the guys and the people who have a solid foundation. They are the solid, they're the solid ones. And God loves them and he uses them because he can trust them. People who are an inspiration to us are people, I mean believers, who have a foundation. They are the yes Lord people and they do what God says. These are the ones that we would want in our churches uh, and that God would want in our churches. Oh, but who's outnumbered? The yes lords or the professors? Uh, let's pray that it's, it's the yes lords. Let's pray that it's them. Now I'm going to close with, an, with, a, 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 with a, a, a reference to, to someone in our church who's a great inspiration to us. I don't know about the others, I'm sure he is, but to me personally, he is a marvellous inspiration to me. And Ken, if you're listening, I hope you don't mind, uh, it's you, our brother Ken. Um, those familiar with, with Ken's recent circumstances will know how for many months he has endured uh, sustained trials. Uh, his life has been battered to and fro. He's faced numerous problems and um, tremendous deep-rooted fears. And throughout all of this, he was being emotionally drained. And then, of course, the saddest of all to everyone, and, and especially to Ken, the saddest of all was his heartbreaking sorrow when... God's dear child Lynn was, was um, taken to glory and Lynn herself was like Ken and our, our brother Ken, I've, I've been keeping in touch with him as some of you have and I, I said to him the other day, I said Ken, how are you doing? He said, Keith man, you know, it's very hard, it's very hard but he says, you know, I'm trusting in Christ, I don't know what I'd do without him, I don't know what I'd do without him. Bless you, Ken. Bless you, Ken. Um, you are a perfect example at this time of someone whose life is built on the rock and, uh, and that rock is Christ Jesus. And Ken can talk like this despite uh, what he's going through. Um, he can talk like this because Ken has accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as his saviour and he has a friend who will stand by him and never leave him. And um, Ken, uh, when you look at him, his foundation holds. No signs of cracks anywhere. His foundation holds. You know, there's a saying, um, have you got any visible means of support? Meaning, have you got any financial means of support? Uh, yes or no, maybe. But you know, the believer, he has an invisible means of support. And you know who that invisible means of support is? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And when, when Jesus spoke about that rock, he meant himself. And dear friends, if you want your life to be stable and have purpose in it, if you've never done so, won't you turn to the Lord Jesus Christ today and uh, turn your life over to him and accept him as your Lord and Saviour. You'll never be disappointed because Jesus never lets anybody down. God, bless us all today and make us, O oh Lord, to be as rockfast steady in Christ as Abraham, as Ken and others are, and as your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, always has been and is. Bless us all now, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.